Do you know what time it is? It's supernatural story time. And if you're easily scared, and even if you're not, there's only one thing left to do. Just turn off the lights, because these are stories that you listen to only in the dark. The Strangest Stories, Volume 6, Story Number 1. When I was about five, me and my mom would play this game. She would sit on the step leading to the back door of my house, and I would ride my tricycle around in a circle and pretend to grab a gem from her. I called this game Volcano because I pretended like I was riding my bike around the edge of a volcano, grabbing precious gems. Anyways, one day we were playing this game, and this lady pulls into the driveway. She was completely white, pale white, like someone had dumped flour on her, and she was wearing a white dress like Victorian era dress. Lots of lace and puffy from the waist down. She also had one of those sun umbrellas, although she wasn't using it. It was closed up and she was holding it by the handle. Anyway, she walked up to the edge of the carport and I rode my tricycle up to the edge to meet her and I just sat there and stared up at her and she looked down at me. After a minute or so, she left. I turned around and asked my mom who the lady was and my mom said, who? I told her, that lady that was just here. My mom had no idea what I was talking about because there was no lady there. It was just me and my mom. Story number two. This story is from my dad who lived in southern Missouri in Elsinore. This happened probably around 1957 or so. He lived in an extremely rural area and they were basically living like in the 1800s so that time so the brothers and sisters would all go off playing in the woods and a couple of miles around the homestead. Well, one night, they were going home from being out somewhere, and as he was the youngest, the older ones tormented him and stuff like that. There were only a few bikes between the seven kids, so it was getting dark, and the older ones all got on their bikes, and some pegged it, and I believe the older kids were probably at home. So they laughed at my dad and took off home, leaving him to walk the last mile or so by himself. Being a country kid, he was a little nervous, but not much at being left alone. So he's walking home, and he looks over towards an open field, with barbed wire fence and sees a figure all in white hovering somewhat off the ground, bending over looking at the plants. He said at that moment his body just froze in fear. The figure slowly turned around and he said it had the typical alien look to it, big black eyes, gray skin, etc. And he felt somehow that he'd startled it. He said he was frozen to the spot and the one thought that came into his mind was, don't be afraid I won't hurt you. He stood there as a figure turned slowly around and floated off into a wooded area. He finally was able to move and ran screaming home. He swears to this day the story is true and there is no explanation for it. A year or so later, the family was all in the cabin and all of a sudden, a glaring bright light from the sky focused on the house. My Uncle Jim and Grandpa ran out with their guns and saw the bright light hovering and then all of a sudden, it was just gone. My dad is not the type to believe in this type of stuff. So I believe in my aunts and uncles know the stories too. Story number three. One weekend I was camping with three friends in northern Arizona. I used to live south of Sedona. It was late February or early March and we decided to go up into the mountains where there was still some snow. We found a great spot about three miles from where we parked the truck. It was a smallish area under some pines and the ground was mostly clear of snow under the trees yet still a little damp. There was still a good six to eight inches of snow on the ground. Well, we pitched the two tents and got camp set up. After eating and sitting around the fire BSing for a while, we rolled into the bags and went to sleep. I had been asleep about two hours or so when something woke me up. I'm a light sleeper, so it doesn't take much, so at first I ignored it and tried to go back to sleep, to no avail. It was just a creepy feeling that told me something wasn't right. As I lay there, eyes closed, I thought I heard something walking towards the camp. I've been in the woods all my life, and I know the sound difference between a bipedal creature and a quadruped, and this was definitely walking on two legs. I grabbed my pistol and light was about to get up when something in the back of my brain told me to lay still. So I listened and didn't make a move or a sound. The steps were growing louder, and then something on two legs passed between the tent and the fire. There was a shadow that passed over the tent but it wasn't as deep of a shadow as it should have been, if that makes sense. Well, I kept laying there and listened to the footsteps recede. Finally, about an hour later, I drifted back to sleep and didn't wake anymore that night. The next morning, I got out of the tent 
and started looking around the campsite for footprints that didn't belong to any of us. Like I said earlier, the ground was still damp, and there would have been prints that a blind man could have followed. But there was nothing. So I started to widen my circle to include the snow that was approximately 20 feet from the fire. Still nothing other than our prints. We had come in from the south, and the sound traveled east to west. I told the rest of the guys about it, and two of them just blew it off. But the other friend knew me well enough to know that I wasn't going to say something unless I was 100% sure it wasn't a dream. The next night, we went to bed, and it was about the same time of night that I awakened again by that strange feeling. The guy in the tent with me was one of the doubters from the previous day, so when I got that feeling, I woke him up. Sure enough, pretty soon we heard the footsteps. They got closer and closer, and the figure passed between the fire and us. I looked over at him, and his eyes were as wide as saucers. I fell back to sleep about an hour later, and I'm not sure if the other guy ever went back to sleep. The next morning, we searched for footprints for at least two hours, ranging out in the direction that whatever it was had traveled, and we still found nothing, more than a rabbit about a half mile from the camp. Definitely not our critter. I'm pretty sure that I now know what it was. It had to be some type of spirit. I know there are several different Native American tribes from the area, and we weren't too far from the Navajo Nation. I believe there was some type of native spirit wandering around, and this is the path they travel every night. Next story. I was living in the small town of Jerome, Arizona, and I was helping with the remodeling of the old mining hospital. The people that bought it decided to turn it into a swanky hotel. They did a hell of a job on it, for sure. One night, we all decided to get together and cook and drink and relax. This was about a year before the completion. I think it took about two and a half years total to complete. Well, I had to go out of town for the weekend and was leaving early, so I only had two beers with dinner and was by far the soberest one in the bunch. Now, everyone in the town knew that the hospital had a reputation for being haunted, but I never gave much credence to the stories. I just thought they were just cool. So about 11 or so, one of the owners asks if I would accompany him to the penthouse to see where they were going to build a residence. I agreed and followed him to the third floor landing. As we started up the steps to the fourth floor, which was the penthouse, I started to get the strange feeling, something that I had never had before. As I went up the steps, it continued to worsen. I felt like each step I took, there was something pushing back on me. I started to get a little scared at that point. By this time, when I reached the landing between the flights, I was completely freaked out and couldn't even breathe. Let me clarify that I'm a pretty level-headed guy, and I've been through some shit in my life, including my stint in the Army as a scout. But this was the most scared I've ever been in my life. I told the owner that I couldn't go any further and that I would see it later. Uh, yeah, right. As I went back down the stairs, the feeling slowly went away, and by the time I got to the third floor landing, I was fine. There was definitely something up there, though, that did not want me in its domain. The next week, I was talking to one of the locals and asked him about the hospital and the top floor in particular. Apparently, that used to be the morgue back in the 60s or 70s. One of the caretakers that had been living there died in a mysterious fire on the top floor, along with his wife. Supposedly, no one knew what started the fire, but there was very little left of the bodies when they got the fire out. Still haven't been to the top floor, even though I have been back to the hotel several times. Next story. This goes back, way back, to my college days. I'm from Ohio, still live there, but went to school in Florida. I had a buddy who lived in Besheeta, Maryland, and I agreed to take him home and spend a few days with him after the end of the semester. After a grueling week of finals, interspersed with just a little partying and very little sleep, we jumped in my 68 Olds 442 and hit the road. Now, you have to understand, we were 19, 10 foot tall, and bulletproof. So we decided it would be a good idea to drive straight through. Besides, we couldn't afford a motel, so off we sailed. As I recall, I-95 was closed for repairs in the Carolinas, so we took the detour. Before long, we put our collective heads together. In retrospect, perhaps not the greatest of ideas looked at the map and decided to find our own route up along the Carolina coast. Well, we were doing pretty good, taking turns driving while the other cat nap or tried to keep the driver awake. I was behind the wheel at about 3 a.m., 
rolling through a wooded stretch with an eerie fog drifted up from the swampy ground. Suddenly, about a hundred yards or so ahead, I saw it. It was a horseman, climbing up one side of the road, sauntering across, then jumping over the ditch on the other side, then off into the woods. The rider wore some kind of long gray coat and a jaunty hat. I swear on my children's lives that just before he disappeared into the fog, he looked back at us with a coy smile. Whoa, I exclaimed to my friend, did you see that? I think so, he replied. Was that a guy on a horse? I slowed down at the spot. We thought the horseman had crossed and rolled the window down on the olds. Looking out into the fog, I felt a chill. Let's go, man. And we did. A few miles up the road, we pulled into a sleepy little town where we were surprised to find an all-night diner. Deciding a cup of strong black coffee might be in order, we stopped and went inside. We sat at the counter and talked about our spooky experience. An old man sitting nearby looked up from his coffee cup and spoke to us in a polite southern drawl. Pardon me, boys, he said, then asked us to repeat the story we had just been telling ourselves, wondering if it was real. We obliged. A horseman, you say, he said with a wry grin. Boys, do you know where you are? South Carolina, we ventured. He chuckled. Oh, yes, you're in South Carolina, all right. You boys just traveled through Francis Marion National Forest. My buddy looked at him blankly. He didn't know Francis Marion was, but I did. I felt a chill run down my back as the old-timer shook our hands and left. And that's how I saw the ghost of the Swamp Fox. Next story. My father and I both served in the Marine Corps. However, as you can imagine, he served way before I did. He served in Vietnam in 1967 near the DMZ. The first time my father told me this story, it gave me chill bumps. I hope I can do it justice and remember all the facts. He said that in the late 1967, his company had been running patrols along the DMZ, occasionally making short but violent contacts with the NVA. He said that they had set up their night defensive position in a very thick section of woods, which in reality was a jungle. He said that at around midnight, it was his turn to stand watch. He said that he sat next to a large tree with his rifle beside him and a clacker for a claymore mine in his right hand. He said that the darkness was so black that you couldn't see your hand in front of your face and they depended more on hearing movement than seeing it. He said that after a while, the fog began to envelop the position. Now, he says that the thicket they had set up in was extremely thick and anyone moving through it would have to make noise and that's why it had been chosen. He said that as he sat there, he began to get a very nervous feeling. He felt that something was not right, and he said he couldn't hear or see a thing, but knew that there was something close by, and he felt an attack was imminent. He said that he turned to look at his buddy to see if he was asleep, but as he did, he saw movement out of the corner of his eye. He said that he swung his head around, ready to detonate his claymore, but froze instantly completely overcome with fear. He said that standing in front of him was a short little man holding a pike and wearing a sword. He was covered from head to toe in Spanish armor from the conquistador period. My father said the little man just stood there and looked at him. Finally, the conquistador said three or four words to him in a language he didn't understand. My father said that the little man then turned and walked into the fog without making a sound. My father said that when it was over, he realized that he was completely covered in sweat. He said it was the scariest thing he'd ever experienced. He said that he memorized the words the man said to him, intending to ask some of the Hispanics in his unit what they meant. But when he did say it, it was in Spanish, and they didn't know what he was saying. After returning from Vietnam that night, still bothered him so much that he did some research and found that the Spanish had fought in that area centuries before he continued to ask about the words the man had said to him, but no one seemed to know what it was. Finally, he asked a friend with some extensive education and learned it was Latin. The words translated into, don't forget to die. Apparently, he had done just that. Maybe a wise warning from an old soldier. I can't remember the Latin words that my father told me, but he can't forget. Next story. A few months ago, me and a buddy went on a camping trip, taking the bare minimum, making our own shelter and killaging and foraging for food. We were six miles from the nearest paved road, about 25 miles from the closest town. 
No logging going on in the area, not another person or vehicle encountered as we drove to our site. The camp is at the end of a logging road, at the edge of a 10-year-old clear-cut surrounded by big timber with an old overgrown skid road winding its way through. We take a trip up the old ski road hoping for a rabbit and venture through the timbers looking for squirrels before we decided to turn around. We got halfway back to camp when we both heard a loud thwack. We stopped in our tracks and heard it again. Not the sound of wood being split or someone slamming a door. It was like the sound of someone smashing two pieces of wood together. We placed the sound about 600 yards away near the timber we had just come from. Then again, thwack. Us being a couple of young guys in our 30s, away from our families and out for an adventure, come to the conclusion that the best course of action is to investigate this sound. When we turned around on the skid road, Walked back to where we just come through, we didn't hear the sound again. Finally, we reached the end of the road where we just stopped and listened. All of a sudden, something was moving through the 10-foot tall trees about 30 feet ahead of us. I've spent a lot of time in the woods around here. It was too quiet to be an elk. Didn't have the thump thump of a deer bounding off. It sounded just like a large man running, definitely not on four legs. That's when I saw a patch of brown fur making its way through the trees. This patch of fur was just as high as the tips of those 10-foot trees. I was about to poop myself when my buddy, who didn't see what I saw, says, probably just an elk. I kept my mouth shut trying to determine if I just saw a friggin' Sasquatch and not trying to sound like a loon. I got back to camp and mine was still racing. We made some food and tried to wind down for the night. I noticed my buddy was a little restless and kept looking at the road. I asked him if he was expecting something to come down the road. He turned to me and in all seriousness says, It feels like something is watching us, like something up on that hill. With no further conversation needed, we put out the fire, packed up camp, and headed out of the woods. On our way out, He tells me that something just didn't feel right about that place. I couldn't have agreed more. Next story. Once while I was camping about 12 miles north of Garberville, California, I had a pretty scary night. After everyone had eaten dinner and cleaned up camp, we all headed to our tents. Usually my friend and his girlfriend would stay up a while playing their Nintendo. We actually lived in the woods at the time, so I was used to hearing people talking quietly and laughing. So I fell asleep. I had a nightmare that I was being drugged out of the camp and was screaming for someone to help and whoever was dragging me seemed straight up evil. In my dream, there was a sound of a girl giggling while I was screaming for help. I don't remember much else from the dream except the overtone that I was being drugged to a well. When I woke up in the morning, I decided to go exploring around the side of the hill where we hadn't been because of huge poison oak patches and we ran our water from the other side. I took my buddy and we walked about as far as I remembered being dragged in the dream. We found an abandoned car from at least the 50s or earlier, so we pushed on. We ended up finding foundations and a large water tank, all covered in second growth and rusted through. What did I find right down the trail from the water tank? An effing well. Like the well from the ring or something like that, cover and all. We opened it and saw the creepiest thing ever. The ladder, barely still hanging together, had the top ten rungs broken off. So someone might have actually been killed or thrown in it. Gives you a pause just to think, what was it exactly that I dreamt about? Next story. A few years ago, it was February, and we got hit by a pretty good snowstorm ended up being around 10 inches. I teach high school and had not begun snowing when I went to bed around 11 p.m. So I didn't know based on the expected amount or the timing whether school would be canceled or not the next morning. Also, I parked in the garage that night so I wouldn't have to clean off the car in the morning. And since I'm almost always parked in the driveway, it may have looked like nobody was home. Anyway, I woke up at about 4 a.m., went to use the bathroom, and I could tell by how relatively light it was outside that it had started to snow. So I went and flipped on the outside light and looked out into the back deck to see how much it had snowed. 
first thing I see is a clear set of footprints in the snow coming across the deck and right up to the door. With how hard it was snowing and the relatively fresh appearance of the tracks, they had probably been made in the last 20 minutes or so. Then they walked over to the deck storage box and tried it, but we had it locked, and then walked back off of the deck. Needless to say, this was very unsettling, so I flipped on a couple of lights around the house to let whoever it was see that I was now up, just in case they were still lurking, and went around and checked all the locks just to be safe. I also took out my 9mm out of the bedside table and laid it within arm's reach of the bed. So I slept little for the rest of the night. Anyway, school was canceled and I ended up going outside later on to shovel out. When I opened the front door, I saw a set of footprints that led up to the door. They were snowed over, but still clearly visible. Whoever had tried the back door had apparently tried the front door first before going around back. So yeah, I was a bit freaked out. Since that event, I park in the driveway every night and put a motion sensor on the back deck light. But I still make sure that I have my loaded 9mm within arm's reach. Next story. This one took place in the 80s, around when the Nightmare on Elm Street movies came out. It was the 4th of July weekend and I was helping a friend move. There were four of us doing the movie and it was extremely hot. He had a pool at his apartment so I wore swim shorts and a tank top and we took periodic pool breaks to cool off, aided by a generous supply of beer. It was so hot, though, we basically just sweated the beer out as fast as we could drink it. We got done around midnight, and I left to drive home, which is approximately 30 miles away. At the halfway point, I stopped in to town to get gas. I pumped the gas, went in to pay for it, plus a pack of smokes and a can of dew. Coming out, I found that I had locked the car door out of habit. I reached in my pocket for the keys and found it was empty. I looked in. And there they were, in between the bucket seats, where they had slid out of the swim shorts. You know, they have shallow pockets. The girl working the station tried to find a coat hanger to use, but they didn't have anything. I tried calling home and remembered everyone went camping and wouldn't be back for a couple of days. I tried hitchhiking, but the holiday traffic at that time was dead. I ended up walking almost 15 miles home, but did get two rides. One from some college students on their way back to school, which brought me to the next town. By then it was about 2 a.m. This small town had rolled up the sidewalks about five hours earlier, so I walked through it on my way home. On the way, I would have to pass through a national park. No street lights back then. Also, I found out the first thing I would pass on the outskirts of the town was a cemetery. As I walked along the edge of the cemetery, I heard the sound of the chain link fence rattling about 50 yards away. I figured a deer must have jumped the fence and I peered through the graves to try to see it. There was a lit-up factory on the other side of the cemetery that backlit what I thought would be a deer. What I saw made my shoulder-length hair stand on end. It was a guy dressed up as Freddy Krueger, running at me with a fedora hat, long, sharp knife blades, fingernails, and a striped sweater in the heat. He was leaping over grapes and peeking at me from behind taller monuments. It looked like he knew his way around that graveyard pretty well in the dark. I think maybe he thought I was a woman? with my long hair and wearing those swim-type clothes, etc. All I had for a weapon was my unopened can of Mountain Dew. I looked in the ditch and found a long metal stake that was once a road sign support. I grabbed it up and noticed it also had a nice sharp edge and was perfect length and weight for a walking stick. I also found a plastic bag and put the pop can in there so I could swing it if I needed to. That dude followed me for a couple of miles, paralleling me off to the side. Past the cemetery, we went past a couple of farmhouses. I thought of walking up to them for some help, but at three in the morning, I thought I might get shot. Or how did I know it wasn't his house? A couple of places had farm dogs that ran out to viciously bark at me as I passed. Then I could hear them bark at him as he followed. Nothing happened in that neighborhood. Then I came to the state park. I bravely strolled through pitch blackness, hearing animals all around me through swamps and over bridges until I came to another town on the other side. By that time, it was almost 5 a.m., I think. I walked past a restaurant that wasn't open yet and staggered around the corner. Evidently, I lost my pursuer somewhere in the wilderness. I looked up above and saw some vultures keeping an eye on me. I heard a quiet noise and looked behind me, and there in an old car, it looked like Norman Bates driving and his mother sitting next to him. They kept their car right on my heel and wouldn't pass me for some reason. I couldn't believe it. Then, a big 4 by 4 pickup pulled up and asked me if I needed a ride. I got in, and the guy was drunk and told me his wife had just kicked him out. 
He asked what I was doing out that early, and I told him my story. He ended up driving me the rest of the way home. When I got home, I slept for a few hours, then called the cops. I thought they would blow me off with that bizarre tale of Freddy, but they were real interested and had an investigator call me back. He was real serious and told me they had found a young lady a couple of weeks before that that had been butchered in that area. I hope that I helped resolve that investigation. Next story. Back in the 70s, I was still in high school. I had an old van fixed up for camping. My buddy Bill asked me if I would drive him up north to camp where his girlfriend was at a lake with her family. At first, I didn't want to, but he said he would pay for everything. Also, I had just got back from a camping trip and the van was still packed and maybe even had enough food for us too. I found out Sue had just dumped Bill and he was on a mission. When we got there, Sue was mad as heck and at me too for bringing him there. They talked for a couple of days and I pretty much stayed in the van by myself. Then Bill wanted to go home. Nothing was resolved between them and he was in a bad mood. We started the long trip home. Back then I used two car batteries so we could listen to tunes at night and swap batteries to recharge the last one used. Well, I forgot to rotate one and our battery was going dead. This van was an old 53 Ford delivery truck. No alternator back then, etc. We coasted into a little gas station in the boonies just before it died. The owner of the station was just leaving for the night and said he could run the cables under his door to charge it if we stayed in the van and didn't mess around. I suppose he thought two long-haired punk kids back then were going to steal him blind. We assured him that we just wanted to get home, get some sleep, and would be gone by morning. He said, okay, just stay in the van. We thought it was kind of weird he would repeat that warning, but we just crashed out in the back of the van. Sometime in the night, Bill woke me up and said, Rick, I hear a noise. I said it was just probably some raccoons raiding the trash cans in front of the van. I didn't hear it, but he said he didn't think so, but I convinced him to go back to sleep. Bill woke me up again and said it was more of a moaning sound. I then told him it was probably a bear. Then I heard it, and it did sound like a bear, so we both got up to look out the curtain to watch it. What we saw made both of our long hair stand on end. We saw a man walking like a zombie attracted to the lit up front of the gas station, bumping into the glass windows and moaning loudly. We thought it was a drunk at first. Then we saw a lady crawling on her hands and knees alongside the man. Then another man came stumbling like a zombie from behind the van, bumping along the side. Something didn't look right about these people. They looked completely gray, lacking any color in their skin, hair, or clothes. The clothes looked old and kind of tattered. They almost looked like homeless, but worse. I told Bill not to make any noise because apparently they didn't know we were in the van. We carefully looked out the back window curtains and saw a whole herd of people walking and crawling out of the swamp across the highway from where we were parked. It looked to be about 20 or 30 of them. We whispered between ourselves, trying to figure out if they were ghosts or what. They definitely looked like drunks, maybe an accident that we didn't even hear about. We didn't see any blood, just weird behavior. Across the highway was just a swamp with cattails growing thick. I said maybe a tour bus just left a casino and crashed into the swamp. Bill planned to go to medical school and I suppose he felt a civic duty to help them. But something still didn't look right and it took a lot of talking to convince him to stay in the van and be quiet. Besides, what could we do? There was no phone, no cell phones back then and if it was an accident, I would think the authorities would be along soon. We eventually went back to sleep. How? I don't know. But when we awoke at daybreak, we saw no trace of the night before. We walked across the highway and no tracks or sign of a crash. We didn't hear anything in the night, like a squad car or ambulance, just the occasional moan. We hooked our battery up, started the van, and continued our trip home. I've lost track of Bill over the years, the only other witness to this event. But I did see on Facebook that he's a scientist in California now. I hope we hook up sometimes and remember this like I did. Next story. When I was in my early 20s, I used to work for the Park Service in Florida. The park I worked at had some pretty creepy areas of its own. It was technically a barrier island on the Atlantic coast separated from the public beach by a tidal creek and the intercoastal waterway accessed by a small bridge. You could also walk in via the sand along the waterline if you really wanted to. For the first year or so, I worked the graveyard shift doing cleaning and maintenance out in the park proper while it was closed overnight. There were two of us covering the shift, overlapping on the weekends and staggering our days off during the week. It wasn't so bad with a partner to talk to, but 
on the solitary night, certain areas could get kind of uncomfortable. The worst area was right around the north end of the tidal creek, where it turned and went back out to the intracoastal waterway. There was a bathhouse on the beach side right at the creek's edge, and another bathhouse and boat ramp on the intracoastal side. Got into the habit of getting my work done in those areas, either right at the start of my shift or after the sun came up in the morning. I'd be swabbing out the bathhouses and would keep getting that hair-raising feeling, like someone was watching me or sneaking up on me. Sometimes I'd hear footsteps or see movement out of the corner of my eye. I'd get my work done as fast as I could just to get out of there. I didn't really want to say anything to anyone. There were still a few guys there who didn't think a woman should be in that job, and I didn't want to sound like I couldn't handle it. Anyway, I finally mentioned casually to a few folks that it could get a little uncomfortable around there, and someone said, Well, you know about Murph the Surf, right? I don't know if any of you older folks remember Murph the Surf back in the 1960s. He was a surfer boy turned jewel thief who was involved in some pretty famous heists. What seems to be less well documented is that in 1967, he and a friend murdered two young women, weighted them down with concrete blocks, and dumped their bodies in a remote tidal creek off the intracoastal. Turns out that was our tidal creek before the area had become a state park. Right in the area, I'd get the heebie-jeebies every night. I was born about a year after the murders, and it was old news by the time I was 20, so it wasn't something I'd heard about beforehand. It wasn't the only violent event in that place either. My father was a cop for most of my formative years, and he told me about several events there. Generally, your typical rapes, drunken assaults, and homicides. I was also told by a couple of different people that back in the 1920s and 30s, the local contingent of the mafia used to dump the bodies they didn't want found in those mangrove swamps. It was a pretty remote place for a lot of years before it was deeded to the state for a park. Once I'd been there for a while and was pretty well accepted, some of the old-timers would tell me that some people sometimes saw ghostly figures around there. One guy swore he'd seen a lady in white walk into the creek and disappear. Although that's kind of an archetypal story, so who knows? My father told me about one call he'd been on years earlier where a couple had driven up to the north end by the jetty to get a little romantic. Someone else, driving up the road a few hours later, found the guy naked and running as fast as he could down the road, screaming that a lady with red eyes had glared in at them. I don't believe either of them were hurt, just really freaked out. The strangest thing that happened to me there was on one of my solitary nights. I'd finished my cleaning within a couple of hours and had some time to kill. We had radio checks every half hour from the front gate, and we'd tell them where we were at at that time. So just in case something happened, they didn't know where we were. Like I said, it had a history of crimes. I had to do periodic patrols through the place to make sure everything was copacetic. But otherwise, I didn't have a whole lot to do. I'd park on the beach near the jetty and was working on a crossword puzzle by flashlight when something suddenly pounded on the roof of the truck. Bam, bam, bam. It had enough force to shake the whole truck. I jumped. First, I thought it was maybe one of the rangers who lived on the premises taking a late night walk and sneaking up on me for a joke. I turned around and no one was there. Now, I was parked in a wide open area with no trees for a good 200 yards and nothing else around me but sand. There was plenty of moonlight reflecting off the sand to see clearly for quite a distance. There was no breeze at all. No one was in sight, and no one could possibly have run away in the two seconds it took me to turn my head. I was more confused than anything else at that point and tried to figure out what it could have been. Thinking that maybe someone was crouched down behind the truck bed or even underneath, I picked up my mag light and already had my unsanctioned pistol on me and got out. Searched all around, under, and in the truck. No one, not even a raccoon, no rock or branch that could have hit and bounced off. At that point, I decided I'd rather go sit in the gatehouse and chat with the on-duty ranger for a while. I considered that part of the park safe until then, but I guess not. After several more months, I switched to working the gatehouse, still on the graveyard shift. The park was closed overnight, but there was a Coast Guard base and a small Navy outpost up near the jetty, and a few rangers lived in the park itself, so someone had to let them in and out. We also had to make sure no one went strolling on in there that shouldn't be there. You'd be surprised how many people wanted 
to go in the park at 3 a.m. and were indignant that they couldn't. A small number of fishermen held passes allowing them to sign in and fish overnight on the jetty, but only on the jetty. Other than tidying up the gatehouse and checking a few people in and out, I mostly sat and either read or watched old reruns on a small black and white TV. It was better up there, mostly. There were a couple of outdoor lights on the buildings and a small street light from about 50 yards away in front with another in the back. The only real spookiness I ever experienced there was seeing what looked like shadows of people run by their door now and then. I'd have to go outside to make sure it wasn't a late night jog or something, but it seldom was. However, while I was still working at the park, there was an interesting event that took place in another park a few miles up the coast from us, and this was in August of 1989. It was close to the busy public beach, but also on the northern boundary of the park with its woods, so I guess it counts. One night, a guy was standing in his house looking out at the garden in the moonlight when he saw movement. On cl taking a closer look, he realized it was a huge python. It turned out the damn thing had been living under his house and eating full-grown raccoons at night. They finally got someone to go underneath and drag it out. The damn thing was 20 feet long. The homeowners were especially freaked out because one of their neighbors had a toddler that would play in the yard. A toddler is not a whole lot bigger than a good-sized raccoon. Next story. One night in Vietnam, while in the jungle, I was the only GI awake. I was on guard. I kept hearing noises of tin cans being moved. I thought it was Charlie moving up the trail to hit our position. I had my M16 across my lap with a claymore clicker in my left and a frag in the right hand. All of a sudden, a tiger let out a roar and scared me so badly that I accidentally set the claymore off and, of course, woke up the rest of the squad, who started firing and throwing grenades. Finally, we ceased fire. No one believed that a tiger was there. I didn't tell many people about this because I didn't want all the ridicule I got. Years later, I was talking with another Vietnam vet, and he told me that he had a buddy that was carried off by a tiger and eaten. True story.